Good evening. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Kendis Gibson. I am an anchor at uh, ABC News in New York for a national show there uh, called World News Now in America this morning, and it really is my honor to be here. Um, I would like to welcome you to the Exploration in Space, a conversation. It is an honor to welcome not only the folks that we have here on stage, but on board. We have 18 astronauts, we have 30 space professionals, 45 scientists and explorers who are all among us. And I have the pleasure, really, to introduce our participants here on stage as well as our moderator. First, of course, we'd like to uh, welcome our, the godmother of this ship, uh, <laughs> Dr. Anna Lee Fisher. And next, I would like to invite our participants and introduce you to them. And there are many, as you can see, um, with a lot of history, so we'll get straight to it. Uh, Tony Antonelli. Tony, right there. <laughs> so Tony is a former US Navy captain and retired NASA astronaut who served as a pilot for multiple missions to the International Space Station. Um, Jean-Francois Clairvoy. I hope I pronounced the French correctly. <laughs> Billy, Bob. Billy Bob, that's that's his French pronunciation. Okay, <laughs> so he's been an active astronaut since 1985 and has flown on the space shuttle to study the atmosphere, resupply the Russian space station Mir, and to repair the Hubble Space Telescope. He is also the chairman of Nova Space. Um, John Fabian. So, Mr. Fabian flew missions on both the Challenger and Discovery and was responsible for deploying satellites for five different nations. After NASA, he became the CEO of a nonprofit public research institute as well. We welcome you. And Rick Hawk, who is uh, on the end there. Sir Rick, many of you know, is a career naval aviator who flew more than 100 combat missions in Vietnam and former NASA astronaut who flew three space shuttle missions, not bad, uh, including the first shuttle flight after the Challenger tragedy. He's a recipient of many military and civilian awards and was inducted into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame in 2001. That's deserving of another round of applause, I'd say. <laughs> Uh, Jay Honeycutt, it, who's right there, is the. <laughs> so Jay is the former director of NASA's John F. Kennedy Space Center, a former director as well of shuttle management operations. He has received many significant awards, including both NASA's Exceptional Service and Exceptional Achievement Awards. Jay, thank you for being here with us. <laughs> Dr. Richard Linehan. He is a veterinarian, a decorated NASA astronaut. He currently works for the NASA Human Research Program and has received numerous NASA and Navy Space Flight Medals. Uh, Captain John McBride is with us as well. <laughs> uh, he's a retired NASA astronaut, naval officer, aeronautical engineer as well. He's currently the director of astronaut education programs at the Kennedy Space Center. Among his many awards, Jay has received the Legion of Merit Award, the Defense Superior Service Medal, and the Navy, Naval Commendation Medal as well. Congratulations. Uh, and Captain Mike McCulley is a retired NASA astronaut and naval officer. and an engineer. He served as NASA's astronaut office weather coordinator and the lead of the Kennedy Space Center's astronaut support team. Mike has received many military and NASA awards as well, including NASA Space Flight Medal as well. Congratulations and thank you for being here. Uh, Barbara Morgan. So happy to have you here. Uh, trained for the teacher in space program and served on Space Shuttle Mission SDS-1118, flying on a two-week mission to help construct the International Space Station. Uh, she retired from NASA recently, 2008, uh, to become Boise State University's Distinguished Educator in Residence. Thank you so much. 
Pablo Nespoli. There you are. Did I say it correctly? <laughs> this is like close enough. Uh, he's an Italian astronaut and engineer who has logged a total of 313 days in space, flying multiple. <laughs> he's like, hey, it's, it's just like any other day. Uh, so he's flown many multiple space, uh, space shuttle missions to the International Space Station as well. Uh, <laughs> Colonel Brewster Shaw, Jr. He has served the United States in aerospace with government and industry teams uh, throughout a career spanning 43 years. He's a pilot and commander of the Space Station Columbia, or Space Shuttle Columbia, and commander of the Space Shuttle Atlantis, and was inducted into the Hall of Fame for Astronauts uh, back in 2006. Not that long ago, congrats. Colonel Woody Spring, who served two terms. He served two tours in Vietnam and then was an experimental test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base before becoming an astronaut where he flew on the 23rd space shuttle mission, launched four satellites, because everybody could do three satellites. <laughs> And he performed two spacewalks. He also served in the Army, worked in the private industry, and is also a professor of engineering. Wow, that is a whole lot. Congratulations. Uh, uh, please introduce, or please welcome Nicole Stott as well to the stage. Uh, Ms. Stott's experience includes two space flights and 104 days spent living and working in space on both the Space Shuttle and the International Space Station. She was also a member of the crew of the final flight of Space Shuttle Discovery. Welcome. And Charlie Walker. who is an engineer and researcher and was the first private industry astronaut on board the three space shuttle mission and later helped design the International Space Station. And while these guys have great experience, I'm really, really excited about the last one because I've spent many, many Friday nights with this woman, but she doesn't know that. That's typical for me. <laughs> Charlie's like TMI. <laughs> So Lynn Sher is an award-winning broadcaster and best-selling author who spent more than 30 years at the network that I currently work for, ABC News, including more than 20 as a correspondent for 2020, which is a Friday night thing before you guys all got weird. Uh, her biography, Sally Ride, America's First Woman in Space, was a New York Times science bestseller. Very happy to welcome her as, as our moderator and our distinguished panel. One more round of applause for everybody. Thank you so much. I've already, um, I've already told him that I'm, unfortunately I can't watch his program because I'm sound asleep in the middle of the night. <laughs> this is so what happens when you, so are you? So <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you, welcome to all of you. Uh, I wanna just start off, uh, for, let me just, a few logistics. Uh, we're gonna talk among ourselves. I hope it will enlighten and also amuse from time to time. Uh, at, the, at some point, don't hold me to it, but at some point, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So please be uh, sure to keep all those questions in your brain. Uh, let me start out with just a little bit of uh, math here. There are some 7.5 billion humans on this planet. Of them, some 536 have flown in space. Of them, 14 are sitting on this stage. You'll go ahead and do the math. What I will tell you is this is one very special group of individuals. However, they are not saints. Just saying. The new, the new NASA administrator, Jim Bridenstine, was asked uh, at some hearings the other day what surprised him most when he got to NASA? Here is his full quote. I knew that everyone at NASA was exceptionally bright, but didn't anticipate how quickly they all wanted to give me their opinions. 
They are not shy, he said. Uh, with that in mind, let's get started. Uh, my first question really is, those of you who flew some time ago, you've had more than a couple of weeks or a couple of months to digest what you saw and what you felt. And my question is, what's the one or two things, what today, today when you think about it, what is it that you saw or heard or felt that makes a difference in your life right now? What do you conjure up when you're thinking about your, your flying days? Well, I think the number one thing to me is being a part of this amazing team and all these people and all the friendships that I forged with all of you, with, all of you, with so many of the people in this room, um, all the people that were in my class and then all my office mates. Many of the people here are people that I shared office with, offices with and it's really been amazing. But then also looking back at what together we've achieved. It's a very complex question, but uh, and each one, I guess, uh, thinks in a different way. I, I get this question all the time. So what are you missing when you're back on the ground? And, uh, and of course, I miss uh, floating around, you know, being Superman, Spider-Man. I miss looking at the Earth. I miss working and, uh, and feeling that I'm really doing something important for me, but also for everybody else. I miss, uh, you know, the tension, but the fact that you then produce something. I miss, as Anna said, the team. The team is incredible, both up there and down here. Uh, but then, you know, I'm, I'm here on Earth, and, and I'm trying not to miss things. So, so you, I, I think instead of sitting there missing stuff, I try to, to look forward, and, and I'm thinking I'm grateful that I was able to make my childhood uh, dream come true. I was able to experience all of this. And so I'm not sitting missing them. I'm, I'm sitting uh, pleasuring thinking about them and trying to give them to the others. So I like to go around and talk to people, talk to kids, uh, talk to them about dreams that can come true, talk to them about Earth and the way you see things from up there, the fact that I think Everybody should be up there. Everybody should try weightless, weightlessness, and everybody should try to look at the earth from up there, because you come back kind of changed. But until they do, that's what you guys are here for, to explain what it's really like. Um, I'm remembering a time when I once asked um, Gene Cernan, who of course was the last uh, uh, human to leave his footprints on the moon. I said, when your mind is idling in neutral, what do you think about, about your moon trip? And he said, driving the limb. He loved driving the lunar, the rover over the, you know, over the hills and the valleys at, in the moon. Um, Nicole, what about you? What do you think about when you think about your time in space? Well, I, I think it's, even when I think about my time down here, let's say on Spaceship Earth, uh, I think about it with, um, with gratitude. Uh, we were just saying, you know, is it special? Is it what? I mean, I feel like I was blessed to have that experience and certainly as Paolo said you know there's the floating there's the looking out the window but in the end I, I try to figure out how to sum it up you know simply and for me it really came down to three things when I reflect on my time and space which I'm also trying to use in a way that uh, takes advantage of the experience and allows me to share it with other people but to have positive action come from it as well. And the three things that I think about every day now are, and they'll sound really simple, like kindergarten level stuff, is we live on a planet, we're all earthlings, and the only border that matters is that thin blue line that blankets us all. And I honestly, I mean, I really feel like it's, it's down to that, you know, that very basic nature of it. And, and if every one of us just thought about that like once a day, like just even considered the fact that we live on a planet, which I don't think we do a lot, um, decisions become different. And, you know, for me, that's, that's what I think about with the time and space. I'm, I'm going to take advantage of this time and I'm also going to say thank you in a way that um, I, I'm going to say thank you on behalf of all of the astronauts in this room because there's a gentleman sitting next to me who, and I am probably gonna be a crybaby, <laughs> who not one of us that flew in space in this room would have done that without this man. And I, I know my personal story. Um, you should, you should, you should, uh, you should explain exactly what Jay did that, that made your life 
work when you're in space? <laughs> well, um, I can start with the fact that I met my husband through, you know, through this man and his beautiful wife, Peggy, who's in the back there. I can embarrass her. Um, and, you know, we met at the Kennedy Space Center. I was working for uh, Mr. Honeycutt at the Kennedy Space Center at the time. I think that was center director days. Um, but Jay had started at KSC when I was there working in the shuttle program and came to KSC from JSC at the time and completely like revitalized what we were doing with getting the space shuttles ready to fly. And I mean that from the standpoint of technically getting shuttles ready to fly, but also from a, like the human side of it, the I want to work in the orbiter processing facility side of it. There, there was a time at Kennedy Space Center where people weren't necessarily happy to work uh, in the OPF. And it turned around, it became the place people wanted to be. And that also happened in the VAB and out at the pad and on the runway. And that was a huge shift in the way operations were done at Kennedy. And I was so lucky to be part of it as this group of young engineers coming out of college that got to go straight into the OPF to work on that really magnificent vehicle. And, and I also know that I wouldn't, I mean, when it came time where I was actually thinking about, wow, could I consider this astronaut thing? Um, because up till that point, I had for years always thought that's something other special people get to do. You know, why would anybody pick me? Um, this was one of the people that I approached to say, should I even fill out the application? And, um, and thankful every day. I hope I thank you enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think he thinks you said Hey, Jay, all right. Tell, Jay, her, I'm, I'm tell gonna, her to shut up. Yeah, I wanna, but I anyway. Wanna, I want to put Jay on the spot uh, briefly if you want. Did you ever think about flying yourself? Oh, well, every day. But, but by the time I got around to, to be, being able to get selected, I was too old to go do it. So. Oh, okay. So you just made it possible plus, for everyone else. Plus, I had a lot of other interesting stuff to Okay. Um, anybody else? Who wants to talk about weightlessness? Let's let's let people know what it really feels like. Nobody. Barbara, come on. Oh, Rick, Rick, go, Rick. Actually, I'm I'm remembering when I did my first interview with you way back when in 1981, and I, I just looked it up, and I said, "This is a naval fighter pilot." You know, I mean, I, I didn't know what to say to him, and I said, "Well, what do you like about flying?" He said, "Are you kidding? With one." push on the stick the world is upside down. You can just move things around. So with that introduction, my friend, go for it. And then you hope you push it right so it turns it <laughs> right side up. <laughs> I like to think of my first experience with zero gravity as it's like the first time I learned how to ride a tricycle, how that expanded my world. I liked, loved learning how to ride a bicycle. That expanded my world some more. And similarly with driving a car and flying an airplane. And this was a new experience, and it was like making me be a child again. All right, nice. Um, Nicole talked about how what she saw from space which I assume you're, we're talking about the thin, the thin blue line of the atmosphere, that tiny little thing protecting us, has changed your outlook. What about some of the rest of you? What did you, what did you see or feel up there that, that may have changed your thinking about how you operate on a day-to-day -day basis? Or does it go away the way so many other things in our lives go away when we move on to the next thing? Anybody want to take that? Woody, how about you? I didn't get a chance to say no. <laughs> nope. There you go. No, being on space is spectacular. I mean, it's, I've been asked, like, you know, did you have a religious experience? And the answer is no. But I kind of do, you know, if you climb a mountain, anybody been up on a mountain and looked at the sunset or the sunrise from high altitude or been on an airplane at 3 o'clock in the morning waiting for the sun to come up so you could do testing? It's gorgeous. And when you're on orbit, you know, every 45 minutes you get another sunrise or a sunset. And it's just, you're so aware of God's beauty on Earth. And it is a fragile planet. And, and you look down and everything you know and love is down there. And it, I can't put it into specific words, but just the feeling is, oh, wow. 
<laughs> it's beautiful. I mean, just wow. And it's just what a privilege to be there, like Nicole said, uh, to be part of the team, to make it happen, to advance our knowledge just a little bit. It's just wonderful. What an opportunity. Anybody else? Give them, a, give them a hand. Weightlessness. John? Well, I remember the great joy it was to uh, put my pants on two legs at a time. Uh, and and I, don't, I don't know any astronaut, man or woman, who didn't do that <laughs> at least once. And uh, Rick and I are about the same age, and today we have trouble just getting one leg in at a time. <laughs> Uh, but it is, it is a really unique, re unique environment. You know, we're high enough that you can turn your head from left to right and see across North America. That's just an incredible, incredible visual opportunity that astronauts have. Uh, but the most amazing thing about flight are the people that you fly with. Okay. First, sir, I'm you're also a military guy with a lot of flying experience. What was different about flying the shuttle from flying, I don't mean just the mechanics of it, but about what you felt when you flew in the shuttle as opposed to when you were uh, flying planes? Well, I started off in a single seat fighter and then I flew a two seat fighter and in the space shuttle, you have to get along with a lot more people, and that's really hard. <laughs> I would like to m make a, a comment to follow up on some of the other things. An Anna talked about um, uh, looking at the Earth from orbit and how you can't see the boundaries, so you, c you can't see the lines. What you can see is the impact of human beings with the naked eye from orbital altitude, you can see the pyramids, you can see the, um, you can see the highways that run you know, up and down the countries, you can see all the grand things that human beings have, have built. And that reminds you that there are a lot of human beings, seven and a half or so billion human beings, and they're down there, and you're up here having this experience. And you have no more God-given right to have that experience with those people down there on the surface of the earth. You're just damn lucky. Right. Barbara, um, let me go to you for a minute. Barbara Morgan got into this, as you heard in the introduction, because she was um, the runner-up in the school teacher in space program. And, and when I first met you, you were the runner-up in the school teacher in space program. And of Many course, years ago. after the Challenger explosion, no, no more civilians were going to fly. Uh, and then you decided to become an astronaut. H how did you get from being school teacher to astronaut? And what was going on in your head? And how did it play out for you? I think, just like everybody else here, incredibly lucky, <laughs> truly. Um, as a, as a teacher, we had made a commitment to NASA, and NASA had made a commitment to the teaching profession. Um, the Teacher in Space program was uh, a wonderful, wonderful program. We had the perfect representative, and that was our friend Krista McAuliffe, um, who served so beautifully as our teacher in space. And the, the goals of that program, first and foremost, was to raise the prestige of the teaching profession. And NASA wanted to reach out to the young people to make sure that we have people who do things like fly in space and explore for all of us and build the vehicles and do the science, et cetera. So those were the goals of the Teacher in Space program. And um, after the Challenger accident, NASA, actually it didn't end. Um, NASA had, first of all, and I, I know I'm gonna embarrass her, but June Scobie Rogers, if you'll please stand up. Thank you. And, and her lovely husband, Don Rogers. Please do. There you go. 
So um, June was our commander, Dick Scobie's wife, and uh, after the Challenger accident, and uh, Anna, thank you for that lovely tribute this morning in, in today's uh, Viking log. It was wonderful. But uh, June, June and the crew put together a living memorial for our wonderful crewmates on the Space Shuttle Challenger that reaches hundreds of thousands of students every year and gives them the opportunity to explore and discover and, and know the joy of exploration and discovery and get the skills that they need to go on and do these kinds of jobs. And so that was one of the, uh, the best um, outcomes of, uh, of the Challenger. And then at the time, NASA had asked if I would continue on as teacher in space and step into Krista's role. And the way I looked at it was we had school children all over the United States and around the world looking at adults in a terrible, terrible tragedy. And how, what do adults do? And I felt, well, as a school teacher, I know that you can talk to kids. That's not how they learn. They learn by doing. They do learn by watching as well. And we had kids all over the country watching adults in a, in a terrible tragedy. And I felt it was important that they see adults doing the right thing when something bad happens. And so June was a perfect example of that. You carry on and you keep the future open for your children. And as, as far as NASA goes, we uh, looked very hard at what went wrong and fix it, but more importantly, what, what we did wrong and how we're gonna fix that. So I just felt it was important to, uh, to, to help, help NASA show that. So when NASA asked if I would continue on and fly at some point, I said, uh, yes, I would. Yes, you would. The idea of teaching is so important. John McBride, you, I know you do, along with a number of others, lead tours around the Kennedy Space Center, and you're out there, you like spreading the word. What, talk a little bit about what that does for you and, and what your memories are. I guess when I talk about the uh, past and the things I got to do and came, coming from West Virginia, a little t state, and getting to fly in space, I use the word blessed. And I have this opportunity now to share all of my experiences and all the, a lot of the folks on stage come and visit us at the Kennedy Space Center. We have a visiting astronaut each and every day to talk about his or her experiences and encourage the young people. That's what we're targeting, the young people just like I was targeted. I was lucky enough to meet John Kennedy, by the way, back when I was a senior in high school, and one year later he made that famous challenge of we're gonna to go to the moon. I was building rockets already, but when he did that, it really got my attention. And I guess you could say the rest is history, getting up in the Navy and getting to come down to NASA with the very first class of space shuttle astronauts, Anna and I are in the same class, Rick Halk, John Fabian, four of us here came down in 1978 as the first class of people chosen to fly the space shuttle. So we were very fortunate to all join together. And Brewster, yeah. <laughs> Brewster was blocked out. Five of us here. Sorry, Brewster. He was Air Force. Sometimes we forget that. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Anyway, it was a great group of people. I, and I love to use the word. We were blessed to have come down there together. And each and every one of our classmates got to fly at least one mission into space. So I guess you could say... NASA did a pretty good job in selecting and training us. What do you think about when you think about being in space? Is it microgravity? Is it something else? No, I, I mentioned the word of camaraderie and your crewmates and working together. Teamwork, by the way, for you youngsters, there's one key word you've got to remember the rest of your life, and that's teamwork. You can't do it all by yourself. So teamwork is the classic word for all of us that I think we need uh, to use and remember. Uh, my... My uh, fondest memory of space is not, well, we all have obviously the training and the execution of the flight plan and all those other things, but my first and most vivid memory is my first observation of Earth from space, this thing I dreamed about all of my life. And 45 minutes after liftoff, we get to get out of our front chairs, and I hadn't seen the Earth yet until I moved aft and set up the switches to hit the button to open the payload bay doors. And as the doors opened, I had to take a deep breath and just almost fainted because we were all over Australia. We left Kennedy 45 minutes ago, and now I'm over Australia, looking at the beauty of our Earth and traveling about six miles every second across Australia in about 15 minutes. And it was enhanced by the fact that right next to me, I actually looked over and put my arm around him with the first Australian, Paul Scully Power, to fly into space was right there with me at that same time. And we had the first Canadian, the first flight with two women, the first crew was seven. So we were doing 
lots of things back in those days, building our capabilities and doing lots more each and every mission that we flew. So I was, was just a, blessed to be included with Anna and John and Brewster and Rick in that very first class of space shuttle astronauts. You talk about looking out the window, and I think we've all seen all those images of astronauts looking out the window and making the comment later, there's no territorial lines, it's just, it's just countries. Mike, let me move over to you. And what's, did you spend a lot of time looking out the window, and what did you see that, that most turned you on? Every second when I wasn't doing something else, my face was in the window. And I discovered that I could put my face in the window and turn upside down on the side, and it was almost like being in a spacesuit doing a spacewalk because you couldn't see anything else. And the, this experience was awesome. And so the Earth, we've mentioned the atmosphere, we've mentioned the, the other things about it, but uh, I remember John Young once giving a speech to us and talking about why we do this, and one of the reasons was we need to establish a human presence off the face of the Earth. And it was sort of a long-term, maybe a 100-year goal out there, but I never forgot that. And so when I think about my experience and how fortunate we all were, I've got this selfish piece as a pilot that would feel so fortunate to have had the opportunity to fly in a space shuttle. After all the other airplanes, you finally reach that pinnacle. That's the selfish side. Jane, uh, I'm the luckiest man alive, by the way, and it starts with her. Uh, we have six children and 12 grandchildren. Um, and so the other thing I think about is what have I done or what have I contributed to that's going to make the earth a better place for them? And the answer is? Well, it's what we're doing. That's what we've all worked on. Um, the fragility of the planet we've talked about, all those things that we need to do better. I use the word uh, stewardship, a sense of stewardship. That's another thing I came back with was this sense of stewardship of, uh, of our earth. Jay, let me uh, just ask you, as long as the microphone's down there, when I know that your job was essentially making things work, getting them up, getting them back safely, was the, um, for lack of a better word, spiritual, emotional, was that ever part of what you thought about and the, and the responsibility that astronauts might have when they came back to Earth? How did you look on that? First of all, I just want to say that uh, Everybody at some point in life wants to stand on the shoulders of giants. Tonight I did that. <laughs> so uh, I'm pretty proud to be here. Okay. You're uh, not taking any of the credit, right? <laughs> no. Uh, I, I just want to mention to all of you, as a reporter who covered this, this was why we lobbied very hard to get a journalist in space. <laughs> Because we wanted little different yeah, answers. Because because <laughs> most of us guys on the ground ain't very damn articulate, so yeah, we can't. No. <laughs> You're plenty articulate. You just don't want to give it up. I know how it works. Let me get down to this end here a bit. Tony, have we had a chance to hear from you? Oh yeah. yeah. I'm a little more. <laughs> yeah, you've ever you've heard everything I was thinking. Uh, <laughs> just out of uh, other diff other folks' voices, so I'll, I'll echo something that. Uh, Nicole said, right, I, 500 and something folks have flown in space. Nicole said something that I think every one of us knows. Uh, we, we live on a planet, we're, we're from Earth. Uh, I still live in Texas, so if anybody asks you where you're from, Earth isn't the answer, right? It's always Texas. Um, <laughs> at least I got part of the crowd. Um, so, I'm from Earth. Uh, I think everybody knows that. The thing that I think the 500 and so of us have failed to do is we up here feel it. And I think y'all know it, but I don't think y'all feel it. And uh, Nicole's got the artistic talents to convey that thought into something that you can feel. And uh, my solution, uh, since I lack those talents, is we're going to have to fly all of y'all. <laughs> Because you really need to feel this in, instead of just think about it. I, I'm sure you don't think about it enough, but until you transition to feeling like you're from Earth, uh, we, we won't make this great uh, transformation that I believe is right on the edge for, uh, for humans. I, I'm pretty optimistic. I expect us to go accomplish uh, great things, and not because we're afraid of something, uh, but because we we just want to do better. And so then the next thing is the future, right? And, and uh, some folks talked about this, about uh, wh what we can do going forward. I'm 
currently working today on figuring out how to do uh, long duration, deep space human exploration and solving all the challenges that come with that. Um, I personally really want to see humans walking on Mars uh, in my little window of time uh, to get to watch what humans do. Uh, I'm coming next to you, you, Billy Bob, but just a minute. When STS-1 flew in April of 1981, a young woman in my office said to me afterwards how excited she was. It was wonderful. And the, this is the quote. She said, I could feel the future. And it was a breakthrough in so many ways. But back to where you just ended, where do we go now? Is it Mars? Is it the moon? Jean, do you want to you take that on? Yes, like uh, Scott Kelly said, uh, we hope that there won't be any more all human on Earth from now on. That means Earth, including atmosphere. That means we hope that there will be always at least one human in space. And uh, there is no reason why we should not go further at some point. I do believe we will go to the moon in the next uh, decade or so. We will go around Mars in the 30s, on Mars, hopefully before the mid-century in the 40s, uh, and it's in our genes, so we, we, uh, we can do it, we want to do it, and if we don't, if we spend not too excessive money, you know, uh, like in Europe, you know, human space flight share of Europe is like around one euro per year per person. Education is 2,000 euro per person per year. So it's, it's reasonable. So let's not try to do a race like uh, in the times of the Apollo, but uh, let's take the time, but do it. And, and we have to go step by step. And about uh, just weightlessness, I was thinking, you know, you talk about uh, your trousers, the two legs at the same time, but did you pee upside down? <laughs> with, without, without the fear to mess up the... Well, thank you for that, John. <laughs> But you know, no, no, seriously, about weightlessness, I want to say something the because... The stewards are now afraid yeah. that everybody is going to try this. No, I, I fly regularly weightlessness on a zero-G plane, and, you know, uh, when you're in weightlessness, your body doesn't press on anything. You don't feel pressure on your body. So if you don't have anything that reminds you that you have a body, like uh, somewhere that itches or pain somewhere, you, you end up being a floating conscience. You forget you have a body. And you feel you are just, you know, by the window, you look at the earth, you think, so you have a mind that's thinking, but you forget you have a body, and that's unique. Yeah. You, you, you need to be floating. Uh, you know, we always rest on something. We stand up, we sit, but, uh, and, and for this, especially looking at the earth, and I want to add something to what Nicole said, you know, about your first question. Since I flew in space, I feel I am a crew member of Spaceship Earth. Not passenger waiting for people to take care of me, but crew member with a responsibility in conducting the ship. That means knowing how it works, then uh, writing the procedures, and then uh, not consuming more resources than I get every day. We don't want to lack uh, you know, resources at the end. And, and, and this is, uh, I think, the goal that we should have at humankind. And uh, something I feel about space after having flown uh, you know, in an par international partnership, when we join forces, we can do great things. Yeah. I mean, the space station is incredible. I mean, it's, look at this uh, space vehicle, you know, 110 meters wide, 70 meters long, with Russians, Canadians, Japanese, uh, 10 countries of Europe, the US, it's, uh, USA, it's, uh, and it works. And with Anna, we work on standards with the Russians who are here, some of them, uh, and uh, defining common standards for how to, display things, how to define procedures, and, and it works, and it works well. So this is, this is what we should be continuing, we should be keeping doing for the future, to go together to the moon, to Mars. Uh, let me move over to Charlie Walker now, because Charlie, you got into NASA and you became an astronaut from the commercial side as a payload specialist. The future has to be public-private, correct? There's no way we're only going to do things through the government from now on. That's my perspective, um, and one slight modification, not a correction, but I never received a NASA paycheck, so there was, <laughs> NASA trained me, sure, because they had the right. vessel that was going that way to do the, both the government research, the academic research, and what I was a part of was some of the, the very first 
commercial industrial research uh, in space. And uh, there's absolutely, in my opinion, as we are all seeing today as evidenced by uh, investors uh, in the United States, but international individuals and international uh, monies being invested in reusable launch vehicles, spacecraft, uh, 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 capsules, human as well as cargo vehicles that are being designed, developed, invested in, and built by industry, that is going to become and should become a growing part of, of what we see as human activity off this planet. Uh, and um, yes, I'll volunteer the word tourism as the most sim the simplest term for uh, the civilian, if you will, uh, non-professional human presence in space. I think it's a much overused term, tourism. I think it's also a, an erroneous term for the experience. Um, it, there's, um, it, it's like, it, I'm going to suggest that uh, it's the suggestion like having a, um, a, a European citizen from the fields of, of Norway aboard a Viking vessel 2,000 years ago. Uh, it'd have to get a little training and, um, and be ready for the severity of the, uh, the environment and the conditions. Uh, for a while, it's going to be rough, roughish, rougher than life at home in front of television and in front of, uh, of Wi-Fi and internet to go into space and come back again. But that's the challenge. That's a challenge that, that both government has been up to in numerous countries for the past 50 years. Industry needs to be up to that challenge, needs to respond to it. And yes, I agree that uh, also it would be a good thing for all of Spaceship Earth if more and more of our crewmates on Spaceship Earth, as Billy Bob so aptly put it, uh, have the opportunity, uh, the challenges, and accept the opportunities to travel to space. And industry is going to be a part of that, as well as we're going to find, we are finding resources and processes to uh, bring back to us here on Earth more and more benefits of the unique environments out there. I, I, I like to say that, uh, you know, the civilization we have on, uh, as human beings on our spaceship Earth today, this civilization comes from... 150,000 years of human discovery and investment in and research on and development of the control of fire, the control of pressure, and the control of the composition of materials. We just now in the past few decades as human beings have been able to control gravity. We don't have anti-gravity machines, but we can build spaceships that go at velocities and on trajectories where essentially gravity is neutralized and we do remarkable things. The International Space Station is demonstrating uh, remarkable discoveries in not only human physiology without gravity, learning things about you and me, even basic function of the lungs. There have been discoveries of the basic function of our lungs that were docked, am I right, uh, Smith Johnston, that were made in, uh, in space medicine that were, had not been discovered here on Earth, but yet are coming back into medical practice as benefits to all of us, and more and more will come from that. And it, yes, uh, government, industry, academia, uh, extension of the human presence through human activity in space is absolutely critical. So, do you all agree that you use the word space tourism or whatever we wind up calling it with civilians in space is a good idea? Yes, everyone yes? Nobody no. Go ahead, yeah, Pella. I would say, you know, when we are up there on the space station, by the way, when we are on space station now, really, they make us work, you know. It's, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's manpower. You start 7.30 in the morning and you're on duty until, you know, 8 o'clock in the evening. So when you get the time to do, you know, social media pictures is in your spare time and, and you have to try to do all you, all you like like that. Otherwise you're working, you're really working. Now they make, you now the timeline is really, really dense and really patched. Um, but I'm thinking all of us is somehow coming from the technical fields. You know, you have engineers, you have physicists, you have medical doctors, but I'm thinking, we should have journalists in space, you know. We, we, should, have, we should have writers, yeah. we should have philosophers, 
We should have photographer. Can you imagine what, what can a photographer do up there if it is there only to take pictures? You know, we take great pictures, but it's like, I don't know what this, this thing works. Click, click, click. Whoa, good picture. You know, something like that. And, uh, and can you imagine if, if a movie director would do a, a movie up there? You know, uh, they keep asking me about sometimes in things like, have you seen God or things like this? And I'm, so the other day we were at the, in the Vatican talking to the Pope and we told him, hey, you should go to space so you can answer that question, you know, better than we do. That, then, you know, it's about time that we open up uh, this... Uh, this, this place to all humanity and have a representation from, from everybody up there. As long as you mention movies, I wanted to, and after this, let's open it up for some questions. What, if any, Hollywood movies got it correctly? Which ones are really got yeah. it right or close, and which ones are absolutely useless? Anna? Apollo 13. Apollo 13, yeah, okay. Anybody else? How about The Martian? Very good. Very good, but a little but bit of I Hollywood loved it. toward the end. A little Hollywood. Okay, um, go ahead. Rick. Interstellar. Interstellar. I thought that was a great movie. Uh, okay. Great 50, movie. 50 oh. years ago, 50 years ago this summer, 2001, A there Space Odyssey came very, very close. I have to tell you, the first space movie I saw, I was a kid, obviously. I believe it was 1950. It was called Destination Moon. Any of you remember that one? A truly ridiculous, black and white, shot on a Hollywood back lot, some really dopey plot, but at the end, at the end, there was a crawl. You know what a crawl is when the words come up and over? And the crawl went, this is the end of the beginning. And I have to tell you, I still get chills when I think about it. Because of the work you all have done and because of how far we've gotten, it is still the beginning, is it not, of where we're going to go? Let's, let's see if we have any questions. I have a million more, but let's uh, like, give you a chance. Oh, I'm sorry, Rick, did you have, want to add Lynn. something? Yeah. No, I, I just Anna. want to, um, I noticed that we forgot one person who wasn't included in the group, Dick Richards. I just want to have him come up here and be a part of our group. He wasn't sure he was going to be able to, to, to be able to talk. And I just want to, he's a very dear friend and I want to make sure he's included. He was in the class of 1980. And there are several other astronauts in the audience. We're not going to recognize all of them because they're still active and working for NASA, and I don't want to get them in trouble. Um, but uh, they're over in this area. <laughs> right. And some of them might kind of look like our initial announcer. <laughs> and then just because, because we're going to start um, um, answering, qu asking questions and everything, and I know that's going to get interesting. I just want to take one brief moment to say thank you to Mr. Hagen and to Krina for this amazing opportunity. I was talking with my friends, and I mean, I don't know, I don't remember ever having a group of all of us get together and talk like this, and I always learn something every time I, I sit and listen to my, my friends and my colleagues talk, and you're asking the question about one of the, you know, what's neat about being an astronaut, and there's many neat things, but one of them is the privilege and honor of working with these amazing people that I've had the honor to work with, that are friends and people that I deeply respect. And the ones that I invited here are the ones that I think the absolute most of. A few of them couldn't come because of um, other commitments, but um, I think these are some of the finest examples of anyone in the space program of that 500 and something number. And so just want to thank all of you for, for coming and thank you, uh, Tor and Karina, for this absolutely amazing um, thing because you promote exploration just as we promote exploration um, exploration here on Earth. <laughs> I wish you could bring some of your comfort up into space. <laughs> At the float out, they, um, uh, I challenged Tor to build the first cruise ship in space. <laughs> and, um, and I definitely would love to go cruise on, on, on that spaceship that I want to name Discovery. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> and I want to be the godmother. <laughs> And so, well, Anna, we all, we all thank you for thinking of us um, at this moment. But since you brought Dick up to the stage, let's give him a chance. Hi, Dick. That's exactly what I was going to do. Let's give him a chance. Um, 
lingering impressions, the future, you pick your topic. Um, are there any Italians here? <laughs> oh, there's one right here. Um, I sometimes get asked about what was the first thing I saw from space. And um, on my very first, fl first flight with Brewster Shaw, uh, you don't see anything when you lift off. And it was like 10 minutes into the flight and all of a sudden Brewster pitched the vehicle over and it was a very clear day in uh, Europe and um, all I saw was this beautiful continent and then I looked out and I saw this country that was completely defined by oceans and seas and it was a clear day all the way to the boot of Italy and uh, Italy you never looked any better on that particular day. So we've been back many times and we will, you've got a beautiful country. All right, now, Dick uh, Linhan, did, we, did you have a chance to answer the best memories from space? Would you like to weigh in on that? I, I guess, uh, I mean, I'd have to echo everything that I've heard, but the one thing for me was I always wanted to go to space somehow. I didn't know how I was going to do it. And I remember, I think I was 12, I watched them walk on the moon. And my grandfather brought me outside and said, well, look up there. you know." And they go, there are people walking on that right now. And I remember going, man, how can I do that? And you know, all through my life, I didn't really know how I was going to do that. And you, know, you follow, you meander the way you go. But somehow, you try to make what you do work in the end for what you want to do. And so when the time came, I applied, and uh, I got lucky and got accepted in the 92 class. And uh, we were supposed to go to the moon. We were supposed to do some other things, maybe. But in, we flew the shuttle, and that was the heyday. It was an amazing flying on the shuttle. But I, Anna talked about this the other night. She said that when you go to space, first you look down, and you see where you were born, and then you see your state, and then you see the continent, and then you just see the world. And for me, everything just kind of came up, and it was like, everything's down there, I'm up here, and I want to go out there. And it just, it just changed me. So when I, come, when I came back, it's like, I think if everyone could go to space, the one way you'd be changed maybe is you realize what a small place we, we live on. It's, it's just tiny little globe, and the infinite, you just look over your shoulder and it's there. And I just, you know, I, I think, uh, Stephen Hawking said it best. He said, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And then to, to uh, paraphrase Carl Sagan, I think he said, you know, we were born wanderers, we'll always be wanderers, but we sat on the ocean, uh, the, the, uh, the shore of the celestial sea for too long and it's time to move out. And that's the one thing that's changed me. It's that I just see us as a space-faring species and I hope it continues. All right, thank you. <laughs> Let's have... Um... <clears throat> Let's have some audience questions. I think there's, yes, sir, go right ahead. My question is, the United Nations hasn't really had a major impact in solving some of the world's conflicts. All of you have been up there looking down on the world. Russia, as our historian has said, uh, uh, China and the United States have been dominating space. Does this mean that the UN of the future with all you as custodians of the United Nations Council is the new model. Maybe NASA or aerospace is the new model for the solution of world conflict. I would love your answer. Thank you. <laughs> Who might like to answer that? Um, I feel as if I, I want I to throw say, it at you because of your ocean experience. I can say just a few words. Uh, uh, before going go to, sp to space, astronauts have to sign the code of conduct, how to behave, and to treat the others and to respect uh, and, and be careful with the resources, etc. If you replace crew member by nation, it fits perfectly as the ideal way of behaving to manage planet Earth. But I, I don't know by heart this code of conduct, but uh, maybe Nicole knows or well, Paolo signed it so recently. I, I, I want Nicole to speak out because are you, the only, is she the, are you the only one on stage who's lived both in space and in the sea underwater? Paolo, did you do an Aquarius? <coughs> so Nicole else? can explain oh it gosh, better than really? I can, but she has not only been on the space station, but spent time in a submersible under the water uh, and has a very unique perspective in that regard. 
Well, I think we kind of joke about it as this like inner space to outer space um, experience, and it certainly gives you a whole new perspective on where we live, on our planet. This may be kind of the, the micro view when you're underwater and then the macro view when you're in space, but um, even on that mission, and it goes to what Mike said about the key being teamwork, and we look at that during our missions, whether under a water, we're on a space station, and it's not just the six people from these different countries on that space station, it's the thousands of people on the ground across the different programs that, like Billy Bob has said, have written the manual, you know, the operating procedure for how you're gonna work. And, and I believe, like I think most of us, if not all of us do here, that it's a matter of scale. And, we wrote the operating procedure for the space station, um, as an example, um, both from the standpoint of when things physically, hardware-wise, don't fix to fit together, we have decided how we'll work together to make that happen. And then when politically or operationally something isn't going the way one or the other wants, we've written the procedures for how we'll deal with that too. And it works, and on the space station, you can look at the last 20 years, we have peacefully, successfully been operating up there and doing really complex things. And I really think it's a matter of scale. It's, we look at where we live as a spaceship, we behave like crew members, and we figure out how to write the operating procedure for how we live and work here. That might be simple, like a simplified idea, but I think it really is just a matter of scale. But it sounds as if, in answer to your question, which of course nobody here really can answer since we don't know what, what it's going to happen going forward, it is about different countries, different personalities working together, which may be the new model. Another question from the audience. Uh, yes, in the middle. Uh, SpaceX seems to be making lots of progress and getting lots of press. Um, do you think they're ahead of NASA in getting to Mars? I haven't heard anything about that. The SpaceX being the um, uh, Elon Musk. Uh, uh, private enterprise, are they, get, are they ahead of NASA? Well, I mean, yeah, but NASA's decided for it to work that way, right? Who wants to talk about the, Jay, can you talk about that a little? It's a different game than what it used to be. Well, yeah, they're, um, they're doing diff different things. Are they, are they ahead of NASA? Well, I don't, uh, I mean, in my view, there's t it's two different races. They're in one, which is to figure out how to get on orbit uh, fast and, and cheaply and, and uh, benefit from that from a commercial point of view. NASA is looking at, at more of a long term, how do we want to, if you will, skip going directly back to Earth orbit and get to the moon and then on to uh, Mars. So I, I wouldn't put them in a competition because I don't think it is. I think it's two, two separate activities both of which are successful, and Space, SpaceX has been very successful, and I, I'm sure they're going to continue to be so, and they may end up uh, with a uh, comparable approach to going to the moon or Mars that NASA has, but I wouldn't, I, I mean, I, I don't put it in a competitive environment. John McBride? Can I jump in with a couple of things? So, that, so they're doing terrific stuff, and, uh, and back to the movie question, the most important movie is the one that gets and keeps the next generation excited about space. So don't worry about the technical details of any of the movies. We just need everybody excited about it. And the, and the stuff that they're doing is exciting. I will tell you that, uh, that NASA doesn't get all the good press uh, that they deserve. They're, flying, or they're driving two rovers on the surface of Mars today. Uh, they've got three Mars orbiters, Odyssey, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and uh, MAVEN in orbit around Mars today. Uh, they just recently launched a lander called InSight, uh, and that's on, on its way to Mars. It'll, it'll land uh, this November. Uh, so uh, I'm good with it not being a race, but you, there's still a lot of great stuff going on that NASA's doing uh, with Mars exploration today, all in preparation for uh, human exploration of Mars. Thank you. John? I'd like to... Uh there's one word we haven't heard tonight, and that's politics. You know, this thing we do, no, no matter what country you you're from. The rules. <laughs> no, it's the general thing about politics. You can't do anything. You can't uh, explore space unless you've got the people at the top. 
who want to fund it, make it happen. And it can happen because I go back again to 1960 and 61 when John Kennedy said we're going to go to the moon by 1969 and people were saying that's impossible. You can't do that. But the government funded NASA to the level to where we made it happen. We landed in July of 1969. We fulfilled that promise. We had a Lunar Mars initiative back in 2004 where we were going to go back to the moon and on to Mars in the next 15 or 20 years, which is now. And we haven't even started that yet. And it's all driven by politics and the provision of the resources to make these things happen. So it has to be a priority if we want to go out and discover things. And people say, why are we spending all this money in space? We're not spending it up there. We're spending it here on Earth. And historically, NASA has developed about 40,000 patented technologies that affect the quality of life of everybody in this room. This ship is driven by NASA technology. So I can only think that uh, in the future, by challenging us to go back to the moon and on to Mars, not by 2030 or 2040 or 2050, let's do it as soon as we can. Because one of the things we've got to develop before we can even take off, and Paolo kind of touched on this, I think, is the ability to recycle and reuse everything we take with us. Yeah. We can't take enough food or water for a two-year voyage to Mars and back with four people. You've got to have the ability to recycle and reuse everything called a closed loop ecological system. And we've got to do that. And just think what that one technology will do for us here, humans here on Earth, by teaching us better how to recycle and reuse everything. We're burying ourselves in garbage. And we can't continue this for the rest of our, our human life here on Earth, so we've got to do better. Thank you, John. Uh, let's go for another question from the audience down here. Yes, sir. I'd just be curious on a perspective of the panel. In your, your opinion, are we it, or are there thousands and thousands of little blue planets floating out there? With, is with, is with there life? life, is what you're asking? Yeah. Well, the best answer that I ever heard for that was from my crewmate, Dr. Joe Allen, who said that the absence of proof is not the proof of absence. <laughs> okay, and here's Joe. <laughs> yeah. Another question from the audience? Yes. What is the best part of your job? <laughs> what was the best part of the job? Okay, John. You can go on a Viking cruise. <laughs> <laughs> I always said the best thing about the job was the job title. Right. <laughs> Think about that. Right. Okay, so what does being an astronaut with the job title get you into besides on a Viking cruise? <laughs> Opens a lot of doors? Go ahead, say again. It's against the rules to use the A word. Against the rules, okay. I call it shuttle diplomacy. Good for you. This is the woman who said we couldn't talk about politics, I'd like to point out. <laughs> um, more questions from the audience? Yes, over here. I have a very simple question. When you land back on Earth from being up in space, what does your body feel like? What is, has it changed? Do you heavy. feel different? Heavy. I'm hearing heavy from a lot of people. I'm going to let Brewster elaborate. Yeah, it does feel heavy. Uh, it, it was pointed out earlier, it, when you're on orbit, you don't need a body. And, and your body uh, atrophies, your muscles get weaker, your bones disappear to a certain degree. So. Structurally, you feel heavy when you get on ground. In your head, your head has learned how to adapt to zero gravity. When you're sitting here and you tip your head, the little hairs in your ears feel gravity, and, and that's how you can walk steadily. Up in orbit, the only thing that makes those little babies bend is acceleration. And so when you get back, your, your brain has to relearn how to behave in a gravity, so you're unsteady on your feet for a little while. So those are the kinds of things that you have to deal with when you get back. But you know what? You can pull it off. <laughs> is, it, um, is it painful at any level? No. Anybody else on being, coming back to Earth? How about the emotional? Uh, oh, go yeah, ahead. I'll please. say something about coming back to Earth. You know, so you're in orbit, and you learn to float. You learn how not to use your 1G strength. And finally, you come down. It just feels like this heavy weight. You, know, you do feel heavy. I remember they put us on a, you know, just had us do a quick physical, you know, just stair step and stuff like that. And you're 
blood pressure is rising and crashing. And, you know, you're just, but we adapt beautifully. I mean, we're, we're, we adapt lovely, beautifully for space. And when you come home, I remember they, they flew us home on a, the shuttle training aircraft from F. Kennedy and bust us home because they didn't want us driving the car. And then the next morning, I hadn't seen my kids for, you know, a month or so because they keep you away from your kids because they're little snot factories, beautiful though they are. <laughs> and, hey, you know, and the next morning, my daughter comes in and, and she says, Daddy, you know, one of those things. And she just runs and jumps. And I knew she was going to hit the ceiling over my head, you know. <laughs> you know it, it, but she was perfect, you know, just right on my chest. And, then, and later on, the phone rang and I wanted to float over and get it. You know. <laughs> And, you know, but, you know, and then I remember getting in the car and driving in the work, show me movies, tell me this was true, it wasn't one of the dreams. You know, no, yeah, you, you did, you know, you, you didn't screw it up, so yeah, everything's good. But, uh, you know, I'll be back to jogging again in two days. I mean, just, we adapt beautifully, uh, but yeah, it, the longer you're up in space, the more your muscles atrophy, and so we have to work out hard. But they've got the protocols now on Space Station to let us survive and work well and come back as good, if not better, than you went up. That's it. Thank you. Back to Brewster. It also works going the other way. In, in 83, we flew uh, Space Lab 1. Owen Garriott was a crew member on that. Owen Garriott last flew in the early 70s on Skylab. And when we got on orbit, Owen Garriott knew how to move around. He knew, uh, he knew how to keep, keep himself stationary. He was just like a ballet. And the rest of us, first timers, you know, we're bouncing off the walls and we're just wasting a lot of energy not knowing how to. So you remember, the human body is a wonderful thing. It remembers being there and it remembers being here. Another question from the audience. We any back in the corner. Hi, if some world-class president stood up today like JFK and said, within 10 years we will land on Mars, and because that's such a short time frame, we need really experienced astronauts. How many of you would volunteer and why? Thank you for the question. Uh, that was a good one. Uh, we did have another question here. If you would stand up again, if you can just reach out for the mic. Hello. This will be uh, relevant for the later astronauts, but do you have to deal with space, uh, space junk? Like any dead satellites that might collide? It's a huge problem, space junk. Who wants to tackle that one? Nick, go ahead. I was going to say Paula was just up there. Oh, Paula, how about you? Right, you were the last one in space. What did you see? It's a good question. and. Uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of uh, debris flying around there. A lot of stuff is coming from the universe. There's not much you can do about that. You know, many times you are uh, looking down the Earth through the cupola, and you actually see uh, stuff coming under your, your feet and, and burning up under you. That's, what is that? Space junk, meteorite, something. You don't really know. We got, actually got, we got a pretty big one coming not far away from station. If that one would have hit the station, it would have been in big, big, big trouble. Um, said that, uh, do we worry about that? Yes and no. The space station was built with a kind of a shield around. So far, statistically speaking, space station has been there for 20 years. We never had any problem. Uh, that doesn't mean it will not be in the future, but from a statistical point of view, uh, we are, yeah, exactly, no problem. <laughs> Um, so, it's something that we are aware of. Uh, we flew for a long time, we did not think about this, we generated uh, debris up there. Uh, now there is a consciousness about this, the, the need of uh, building uh, satellites or stuff that doesn't blow apart or don't generate debris. Uh, the need of uh, deorbiting things. And, and I know there are a lot of, there is a lot of things uh, around the world to actually force the people that send things in space to, to have them build inside the capability to bring them back uh, safely without generating any debris. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be an interesting thing. We, we hear about this Kessler theory about the fact that the, uh, the debris in space are going to collide and in the next few years they're going to generate a, a cloud of debris around the Earth that will be similar to the rings of uh, Saturn and it will be impossible to go to the moon or go through or everything will be... I don't know about that. I don't know what, what you guys feel about it. Um, in any case, it, 
uh, we are up there in station, we work, and we don't think about that, and nothing. Well, I, I just so want far. to bring up um, John and Rick on STS-7, as I recall, when you came down, wasn't there a little ding in the, go ahead. But there are dings all over the place. I understand, but. <clears throat> After a sleep period, um, we noticed that on the front windshield of the, uh, of the space shuttle Challenger, and by the way, we fly upside down and backwards. I'm glad ships don't do that. Uh, but, but we do that in order to protect or give it the maximum protection to the crew. Uh, but we notice this, this, this ding in the window. Uh, we have two panes of glass about, what, three quarters of an inch thick? It's, it, it's really quite a lot of, of glass in, in front of you. But something had hit us uh, in, in the window while we were sleeping. And after we got on the ground, it turned out after a detailed chemical analysis that the scientists decided it was a fleck of paint. Just a fleck of paint had hit the window and it went halfway through the outer of two panes of glass. Now, fleck of paint, imagine what something the size of your thumb would do. Yeah, it's a real danger, but fortunately, space is a big place. Uh, more questions? Let's go right here. I wanted to ask you if your, when you came back, if um, your habits changed in daily life. So I can imagine so that you saw the Earth, you saw the fragility of our Earth. So might be you said, oh, I'm going to sell my car, I want to have an like, electric car, I'm saving energy, I teach my children not to use too much water. So what is the, the change of your habits? What are you doing differently on Earth? Yeah since you flew. <laughs> you didn't like that question. Well, nobody gave question. me a Tesla or I'd be happy to drive it. <laughs> <laughs> One Tesla coming up. <laughs> I'm on my third Prius. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which obviously was after you flew because they after. didn't exist when right. you flew. Exactly. <laughs> no. Actually, it's a, that's, a, that's a good question. I was thinking about that, you know. And, uh, you know, I always teach my kids not to use too much water, turn off the electricity, even before I went to space, so nothing has changed in that. But, but I was thinking myself about what am I doing that I change? And strangely enough, I realize I'm going around the world much more than what I was going around before, talking to people about the necessity of, of doing this. And I'm flying on a jet thinking I'm burning a lot of fuel here. Yeah. And, uh, and so in a kind of a strange way, I feel guilty because I know now I use, if it feels like I use more resources uh, to go around. Now, I kind of think from a psychological point of view, okay, I'm using more resources, but I think I talk to more people and then the net results is positive. But in fact, uh, I feel I'm failing a little bit in, in doing this, especially if I'm going in a cruise, by the way. <laughs> Let me, um, before we go on to another question, I want to ask the audience a question. Um, do we have children in the audience, or have we gotten beyond bedtime? We've got a few. I want to know, among the children in the audience, how many of you think you might be interested in space travel as, a, as a, something fun to do or as a career? Anybody? Highly yeah? recommend it. Highly recommended from Nicole. Come on, Amelia. <laughs> okay, think about it. We're counting on you. Won't happen without you. You know that, right? Any more questions from the audience? Yes, June. Thank you all. You, you're terrific, great friends, all of you. When uh, Dick Scobie came back from space and he was sharing with me what it was like to fly, um, I interrupted him at one point and said, uh, but President Reagan mentioned every crew member's name except for you. Didn't that make you mad? And he said, oh no, June. What was important was the mission. We had a great, successful mission. I've heard from you all about the camaraderie I've heard about you, from you about the joy of flying in space, but how do you feel about your mission? Thank you. 
Thank you, June. So I think there are two ways to answer the question that you want to tackle. One is the, the sort of Uber mission, and the other is your individual mission. Who wants to go? Charlie, you look as if you're ready to go. Unfinished. Ah. The, the, uh, I, I was asked to comment on the industrial, the private sector side of, of the possibilities, and certainly those are only just beginning. But to speak of, and so that was my mission aboard my flights, was to begin research and development toward industrial processes that could create or, or improve things that we carry to space using the microgravity environment and then bring back better products like pharmaceuticals for us all. We have yet to see that accomplished because we don't have the regular transportation system, the efficiencies of up and down, the, the inexpensive transportation that's going to be required, relatively speaking. That mission is certainly unfulfilled, but bigger than that, I mean, I was a part of three different uh, spaceflight crews. All, um, all families in many ways. And I, I, I would challenge anyone of us that have flown up here to, to say that no, you don't feel close to the others that, that flew with you. I think we all do, I know we all do. And I, there's, in my case, there's a sense that the things that we all did aboard our space flights were small steps with a bigger objective out there, some kind of, of benefit in terms of learning more about human physiology, learning more about techniques to, to utilize the environments of space for benefit back here on Earth, more about technologies that will reuse raw materials and materials that we have used and, and used, expended, only to, be, to find ways to turn them around again because, as was said so well, of course, uh, two years uh, a mission to Mars, more than that, uh, we can't take everything we need with us. We'll have to develop the technologies to do that. We should be doing that close at home. That mission's unfulfilled. Um, we, we have ongoing missions, and certainly in terms of uh, teaching, as we've talked to some extent about here, is to uh, teaching our fellow crew members of this spaceship Earth um, their interconnectivities, that they maybe don't realize or don't see as deeply as maybe some of us do or sense, that mission is unfulfilled. Teaching our young people, teaching all of us that self-education, professional, formal education as well as informal education, learning should be a lifelong thing among all of us for not only pers our personal selves but for our families, our communities, and beyond. Uh, I think that I cannot imagine a mission that actually someone has started on that was fulfilled with maybe one space flight or even two or three. Go ahead. No, I got I got a mic. So, so the question is, you know, as you as you go on your space shuttle mission, I mean, your purpose in life is to do that particular mission. Again, you want to do it as well as you possibly can, and we work and we train and we go and do that as a team. And when you come back, if you've done that well, then you, you have a sense of satisfaction and it's wonderful. But there is an Uber mission that I, I, I came to realize after the fact, you know, I cut a deal with God. I, I don't know if he or she was listening. I don't know if he, they said, yeah, okay, Spring, I'm, I'm with you on this one. But, you know, you let me do this, I will, I will carry this with me and try to do the best I can to help other people understand what the opportunities are and, and what we can do in space. And so I'm still trying to find out how do I make that realize, but I do a lot of STEM work. I talk to schools and high schools and things like that. And I think that's part of it. I think every one of us do some level of that. Uh, of giving back. Of giving back. And uh, to me, that's the, that is the lasting mission, the bigger one. I, I'd love to have had five or six shuttle missions, but it didn't happen that way. But I do have this other mission of helping share the word of, of what what the opportunities in the space are. I mean, the history of humankind is off this planet at some point in the future, and we need to prepare. It doesn't happen immediately, but we need to get ready for that. All right. Go ahead, Anna, did you want something? I just wanted to say that one of the other things that really struck me about 
the space program is. Um, when I um, took a seven year leave of absence to stay home with my girls and then I came back and I found out that we were gonna be partnering with our Russian partners, at first I was like shocked. <laughs> Couldn't believe that, that we were really going to do that. And then as I learned to, to work with our Russian colleagues, I learned just the real value to me of some of these large products, pro projects like going into space uh, is to learn to work together with our international partners. And two of the people that I worked with, uh, Tatiana Matviva and Sergei Bronikov, are here uh, as part of my guests. And, and um, one of my most special memories uh, of all is that um, I remember one day I was in uh, Moscow and Tatiana and I went out to have dinner. It was a full moon right by the Kremlin and we're sitting there having dinner and a glass of wine. And I'm thinking to myself, I had seen that same scene on TV, black and white TV in the 60s with all the tanks and everything going by. And here we were as, as friends and partners uh, sitting there having a glass of wine. And that memory is just always stuck in my head and is so special and I wanna thank Tatiana and uh, Sergey and all of our Russian colleagues and all of our international partners. Um, and, and I really think that's a one way forward for all the other problems we're having in the world and just wanted to mention that part of things. It's amazing how many of your memories and your, the things you care about regarding your space flights are all earthbound, which is to say you come back and, and, and you apply it here, which I guess is really what it is and what it should be. Let's take two more questions and then we're gonna wrap this up. Yes, sir. Most of what you do is based on science, technology, energy, engineering, and math. Uh, you know, four astronauts have reported spiritual experiences while they were in space. Have any of you had anything close to that? I just want to say, after covering NASA for a lot of years, they're not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for trying. <laughs> Another question. Right, right, right here. Was kommt nach dem Universum? What's behind the space? What's, What's behind the galaxy? Is it, is it endless? Is it endless? Oh. When, they're, when you're up there, do you feel as if it's endless, Charlie? When I looked out the window, and, and I think it was either Rick or Tony that said this, you look at, at the Earth and it's a finite place, and that affects you, us, me, mightily. A single place, a single spaceship, Earth, a planet, but over your shoulder is infinity, is, is an abyss, an expanse of eternity. Eternity, we think. No one really knows, and so my words are, let's go find out. Right. And with that, um, I just want to add that in, um, uh, I think it's on Tuesday, will be the 35th anniversary of STS-7. Um, not only were Rick and John on that flight, but Sally Ride, America's first woman in space, was on that flight, uh, which reminds me to point out that there have been something like 60 women who have flown totally, is that right? And you've got three of them right here. So an extra shout out. Thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. And thank all of you and special thanks to Anna and I told you, they are very special people. Thank you and good night. One thing really quick before y'all get up, I just want to say thank you again, Tor and Karina. And Anna and uh, all of you, I will not ru ruin this by saying anything, but thank you very much for what you have done earlier in your life and with all the knowledge you and your colleagues have brought all of us earlier. But I must say also today, a fantastically interesting uh, thing to be part of. I have never seen this uh, uh, theater so full and I think all of us enjoyed it very much. Uh, I'm sure that our motto to explore in comfort may not apply to what you guys have been doing, but I hope you enjoy the rest of the cruise and thank you very much for coming here. Thank you. Thank you.